Okay, good afternoon. Uh, so I come from Finland, University of Helsinki. I have just started my PhD research there, so I'm sort of a beginner. <laughs> and uh, this topic is not not in the core of my my research. I am actually studying the history of the concepts of prehistory and Stone Age and the furthest past and the change in the language and the concept history and also the early archaeology done in Finland in the 18th and 19th centuries. But uh, this subject is something that uh, came up that I haven't, haven't thought about uh, before until I, I suddenly realized how important this is, that the Stone Age structures had a very important role in the discovery of Stone Age. And um, this also led me to think more of all the theories surrounding uh, structures and buildings and how they help us to con contextualize time, the passing of time, and so on. Building structures, ruins, so on, they are such, an, uh, such a significant feature in the landscape that they have always had a profound impact on people's view of the past surrounding them and the time itself. And there is also a lot of uh, folklore um, related to these uh, structures, as you can see from the name used for that type of piles of stones. So I'm going to first just go over some overall things about Stone Age megastructures and the phenomena related to them and then discuss these um, giants, churches, monuments and other similar structures and then get to the theoretical viewpoints on the multi-temporality of architecture. Since I am not an expert on Stone Age architecture, I will not go deeper into the megalithic studies. I will just try to present some aspects of the ways they have been seen. So please don't ask me anything about the actual archaeology of these sites. <laughs> <laughs> so very commonly, these sort of megastructures, mega megalithic structures in the landscape, they have had a supernatural origin uh, imagined for them by, by, by the people. Uh, and also not, not just in folklore, but also in early historiography, when, when they relate on textual remains. And these prehistoric structures were beyond the borders of textual past. And since they could not be fitted into the familiar text-based timeline of history, they sort of were disturbing. <laughs> and they looked man-made, that at least that someone had made them. So maybe they were made by supernatural beings. Similarly, like Stone Age artifacts were thought to be thunderbolts or elf arrows. Uh, often megalithic structures are connected to giants or some similar race that is thought to inhabit the area before humans, like the giants churches in Finland. Like, and these uh, uh, <coughs> monuments in Sardinia, they are called giants graves and also sites that are related to megaliths, like this island example, they are called something that relates to giants. And for example, in, in the Basque language, megaliths and other visible prehistoric sites are often called gentilari. I don't know actually how to pronounce that, or maybe like in, like Spanish, gentilari, after the mythical race of giants uh, that were thought to inhabit the Basque country before and alongside of humans. And some megaliths are also related in folklore to other supernatural beings, for example, fairies, like this Pied uh, de la in Provence. I really like that. It looks like an animal or something. <laughs> it's cute. <laughs> <laughs> so megalithic structures, uh, for example, in Great Britain are also commonly associated with the Druids and the Celtic heritage a misconception that has lasted until this day? Or is it actually a misconception <coughs> if we think that these structures uh, include all the faces in their <laughs> biography? They have also been there at the time of the Druids, but not built by the sort of mythological <laughs> Druids. Uh, this um, Druidic stuff is sort of the utmost border of textually built past. So it could, it could be extrapolated to the whole yawning years of prehistory, as Daniel says. In the Nordic countries, in the pre-19th century historiography, 
we uh, did the same thing with the Vikings. So these are sort of the <coughs> things that you can reach through textual sources and then think that, okay, maybe the whole yawning years of prehistory were like this because there are some evidence about that. So these are coping strategies for the old time historians and antiquaries to deal with the discomfort and vagueness of the distant past without textual evidence. Okay. Uh, so this one large giant church monument I'm talking about is situated there in the um, northern coast of Finland and also all these structures that are called giant churches are situated in there in the coastal area. So they are these sort of rectangular or oval structures made of piles of stones. There is this uh, empty space and in the middle and the walls are made made with with piling piling of stones. And the walls can be really like over 10 meters thick like in this one the castelli side in, in Rahe but most of them are smaller. This one is the largest so there is much more uh, research done on this one and also a lot more folklore related to that than the smaller ones. Uh, there are sort of doorways or openings in the walls as well so that you can get inside the thing and uh, there have been of course some studies done on these uh, sites that about the orientation of these things that the structure itself or the doorways they are oriented towards um, north south or the sunrise on summer solstice so winter solstice and so on and these uh, structures are dated to the late neolithic or early bronze age and there are usually other sites in the vicinity of these as well but what were they used for actually in the stone age we don't know it has been proposed that they were used to store uh, meat or fish or something or <laughs> that they were religious structures or that they were forts used for safety for defense if someone attacked but we don't actually know. And some other examples of these names of these structures in folklore, uh, well, this Bronze, Bronze Age cairn, but they are also called goblins, sauna stoves, because they look like someone, well, he says not like goblins, more like an ogre, a more scarier creature, that maybe they had a sauna there and <laughs> so on. Uh, and then, then we have some of these I think they are called in English the city of Troy or something like that. Um, even though not prehistoric, from the historical time, but there is the same kind of tradition and folklore related to these as well. These um, labyrinths made of stones, they are found in Finland in the southern coastal area and in the archipelago. Then they are also called Jatulin Tarha, which means a giant's court. So all these strange looking structures in the landscape uh, had been in folklore attributed to giants or other mythical beings that are thought to predate humans, so that these structures uh, were there already when humans came to the area of Finland. Okay, so that was folklore, but this is science, <laughs> early science. So different kinds of piles of stones in the landscape or the larger megalithic stones also attracted the attention of historians and other people researching the past already, well, during the 18th century, already before that, of course, but more scientifically in the 18th century. And first excavations uh, done on these giant church, church structures or, or these other large canes also were the earliest Stone Age excavations or Bronze Age excavations done in Finland. Because you can see them, these in landscape, <laughs> you can't see settlement sites that well. Uh, in the 18th century, the view on history and the past was still tied to the biblical frame of chronology, even though it started to crumble during the century. So all these clearly man-made structures, they uh, were thought to be of pretty recent time because they had to be. Um, and this started the thing with the Druids and so on. And now that we have talked about the past in the past and so on in this conference, it's interesting to study the 18th century view of the past, that uh, they are already aiming for scientific explanations, but they, they live in the pre-time revolution world, so they, they have really, the time frame is really small for the, them to fit these things into that. 
uh, and these structures in the landscape were sort of a reminder, disc like a discomforting reminder of, of this unknown past that was somewhere there beyond the textual uh, evidence and so on. And all these names, names that people have given to these uh, monuments or uh, piles of stones, they remind us of this, uh, there is this layered folklore attached to these structures that show uh, how significant part of the landscape they have been in all times. Their original use had been long forgotten. For example, these giant churches, we don't even know today what, they, what the people were doing with them during the Stone Age. But they have been there during the whole time and people have attached different meanings to them. So um, I think that not like Levi Strauss says that animals are good to think with, where well, they are also good to think with, but I think buildings are good to think with. They uh, help us to contextualize time, to make us understand the past and future and uh, the present as well. And also to contextualize theories about time, like uh, Fernand Brodel's multi-layered time. If we look at these like, for example, Stonehenge, we understand the long durée is going on in there and people are just uh, living their lives in a, in a different layer there. Um, this, they pre well, buildings present a bridge to the, between all layers of time and sometimes even, even literally, for example, in fiction depicting time travel, uh, sometimes there are these that you have to you have to do the time travel thing in in vicinity of some sort of monument that you know that will be there even in, in another time when you go there. Um, there was also some talk about these um, ruins and uh, circles of stones in the archaeology and science fiction session earlier today. And uh, I think it's it's sort of the same thing that if you if you think of the 18th century historians that uh, thought that the stone structures were strange because you can't can't find any written evidence for them. It's sort of the same thing in horror fiction, for example, that they are scary. Somehow there is something something uh, strange going on with them that you can't you can't reach. And uh, still one thing that I just added. But maybe the question we should ask about the Neolithic structures is also that did their builders mean them to last this long? Did they think of the future? Like Gavin Lucas said yesterday, what was the future in prehistoric societies like? Or were, were some of these things just left unmoved in the stream of time by accident? Thank you. Mm -hmm.